Just because you're in a rural environment doesn't mean you're automatically safe. It doesn't mean you're insulated from violence or dangerous activities in the future. Although that is a perception a lot of people have. And of course, based on what we've seen since 2020, where large acts of violence occur within our major cities, it does feel like it insulates you to a degree from some of those mob-related actions. But there's proof right now that even if you live on a farm out in rural America, you can be targeted. And yes, people do know that people like yourself, myself included, live out in the middle of nowhere and generally have to have a certain level of resources in order to be able to do so. What am I referring to? Well, we're going to discuss a lot of what's happening in South Africa in this video and why it is very important for you to understand that the people down there who are being targeted and attacked on their farms probably felt the same way in the sense of feeling safe by living out in a rural environment. And as of right now, there's been an uptick in recent attacks on those farms, which is why I'm bringing this to your attention. And I also want to discuss some of the parallels between what's been happening there and what's happening here in the U.S. for why you might want to consider some of the solutions that they've come up with in South Africa that might be applicable here in the U.S. at some point in time. Now, before we go further, I need to mention that Midway USA is the biggest supporter of the channel. And of course, they have a lot of the things that you might require if you were to utilize some of the solutions that South Africa has developed. So big thanks to Midway USA. Now, Human Rights Watch describes a general trend of escalation in farm attacks, which is what they call these, starting in around 1994. So this has been going on for a very long time. And of course, it's all in relation to a lot of what happened in South Africa regarding apartheid and everything else that's been going on there politically. And here's the thing, I'm not necessarily here trying to deep dive into the politics of South Africa, because that's a very complicated conversation. But some of these attacks, of course, are politically motivated. So we are going to discuss some of that in order to kind of develop an understanding as to why there's some parallels here in the U.S. and why you should have some level of concern about this being a possibility in the future. Now, a recent uptick in these attacks, which is why I'm bringing this to your attention now, is due to the economic freedom fighters who recently had a rally, and yes, this is a political party in South Africa, where they promoted a lot of this behavior based on political ideology. And of course, right after this rally, there was quite an uptick in these farm attacks, which generally targeted those of a certain culture and a certain type of human being. Now, these attacks are brutal. And they come often in the middle of the night, sometimes in broad daylight, but generally the number one commonality between these attacks is that the farmers themselves were outnumbered and didn't have the ability to defend themselves based on the strategy used by the attackers. And if you just go look through some South African mainstream media and try to find anything about farm attacks, you'll see that these are happening on a frequent basis, one after another, almost the same MO every single time. And I'm sure that these people felt they were relatively safe away from the major cities living out in a rural environment uh, and assuming that they were insulated from some of that violence and danger. But unfortunately, people know where they are and there's political motivations for why they are searching them out. One of their only options, one of the only solutions that South Africans were able to come up with when it came to trying to deter some of these events from occurring was by utilizing local quick response teams, basically commando units or Minutemen who are in their localized area and are willing to quickly respond to their call for help, call for aid, and get there and deal with the threat and hopefully help their own community. This is not the police. The police are not very effective in this situation. So these localized teams are kind of all they have. And in fact, many farmers down there have what amounts to a panic button inside of their home that they can hit, which then alerts their localized response team to start heading their way. And yeah, it might still take 20 minutes because we're talking about rural environments where people live very spread out. But the police aren't showing up for 45 minutes to an hour or even sometimes not at all. So this really is their only option. And in fact, a group in South Africa right now called AfroForum are training farmers in South Africa in self-defense because these people need to know what to do in regards to saving their own lives. And this is the type of training that we suggest everyone get here in the preparedness community. It's something that is well promoted throughout the community. And these are some of the reasons as to why. The police don't respond at all sometimes. And in any SHDF scenario, you should expect there not to be any police response. But depending on where you live, 
you might have a sheriff's department of four or five deputies, right? Well, on a busy holiday weekend, what's the likelihood that you call 911 because somebody suspicious is on your property and one of those deputies is completely available and nearby your property? I don't think that's something I want to take a bet on. So is organizing a localized reaction force in your area a good idea? I mean, I think having a network of people who are in your locale that might be able to come help you is a great idea, of course. But do you have an organized team that might be able to accomplish some of the same goals that they're finding out they need to be able to do in South Africa right now? That's a consideration I would probably begin to make because in all honesty, no one down there thought they would have to be involved with this type of behavior. And here they are, literally militia units for the most part, that have to jump in a vehicle fully armed to the teeth and show up to an unknown situation and possibly have to engage people who are armed that are trying to hurt their neighbors. This isn't a modernized country that's happening right now. And if there's a lot of political ideology that's pushing this whole situation, of course, politics and Marxism and some of these other ideas that are being pushed upon the people are justifying some of this behavior in their minds. And this is something we're seeing here in the United States quite a bit as well. We know with some of these political groups that are here in the country, they target and blame people of certain backgrounds and cultures and races and ideologies and political affiliations for their problems. And eventually that spills over into people actually acting upon those concepts. Now, this is also a fault of the government there. This is something that you have to be aware of because the government's not always on your side either and you shouldn't expect that. I mean, let's be honest, it's 2023. Who, who really expects that at this point in time, right? But this is a big part of that equation and we can see how our government, our media and our society, whether or not we agree with it, is leaning towards some of these ideologies that eventually evolve into what's happening in South Africa. And this is why this is becoming a dangerous situation, especially for those of you in rural communities who don't have the same level of protection of like a suburban neighborhood. Although that sounds totally backwards, you know, I live in a rural environment for many reasons. We do insulate ourselves from quite a bit of the chaos by doing so, right? Well, the other thing to consider is that at least in a suburban neighborhood, you've got 10 or 12 houses on the same street of people who might be able to help you out with a problem. Versus here, I would have to have something organized ahead of time in order to ensure that that was even a possibility, right? So this is why we're having this conversation because I want everyone to get out of that mindset that by just having space means you're automatically safe. In fact, it does have some downsides when it comes to getting help quickly, depending on a situation. Now, do you wanna mention that things are tough and everybody's trying to figure out what they can do when it comes to this economy. So look, if you, are interested in stabilizing some of your wealth with precious metals and you're trying to maybe do like a rollover IRA to avoid any tax um, issues that might come up by trying to reallocate some of your assets into things that might be a little bit more stable during these harsh economic times, then I would suggest checking out Genesis Gold Group. They support this channel, which means they must be pretty legit since look at the stuff we're talking about here. But in all honesty, very good group of guys over there. They're a faith-based company, which means they do operate under a certain set of morals, but you do not have to share their faith in order to work with them. And if you're interested in doing those things or just interested in precious metals in general, and you want to support this channel, then check out magicpreppergold.com because it helps keep the things going over here that we're discussing right now. And it will also help you if that's something you think would be an asset for you during a post SHTF and a pre SHTF environment. Just Throwing it out there in case anybody's interested. Now, and I'll have a link down below as well as in the description. The South African government is complicit in a lot of this. And this is something that concerns me quite a bit based on the trajectory of our current government, our Department of Justice, our bureaucracies, including the FBI and the ATF and all these other organizations that don't seem to have our best interests in mind. Well, the South African government has been buying farmland for quite some time now with basically the intent to redistribute it, right? And you have to at least question the idea of these attacks are occurring, these people are being scared to death and wanting to possibly leave their homes because of the fear that is being placed upon them. And this same farmland is what the government is trying to procure in order to redistribute it. And the same government works with some of these political leaders that are promoting a lot of this behavior you have to at least consider the fact that there's more to this than just mad people, right? Consider that and understand that 
Just because this is the United States doesn't mean we're just going to be insulated from everything that happens to any other country in the world. Like I said, South Africa is a modernized country. It's not a third world country. It's becoming one, which in many ways, so are we. Here's another example for you that kind of lets you know what's happening there related to the government and how they can disrupt and even make rural environments less safe very easily with the flip of a switch, actually quite literally. Power cuts by the state provider ESCOM down in South Africa disproportionately affect rural areas. And they're losing power all the time down there because their grid can't sustain the population. And right now, in rural environments, some of these people are losing power for weeks at a time. And it's gotten to the point where these rural residents are actually protesting, which is uncharacteristic for people in rural environments because generally it's hard to organize a protest when everybody's so spread out. But they're actually protesting because it's gotten that bad. And if you're in a rural environment, and you rely on the grid in order to produce your agricultural product, then you are completely screwed if they shut off the power. And we also know how dangerous things become if the power is no longer there. And the ability to reach out to these quick reaction forces might not exist if there's no power to power any of your communications gear, which is why secondary power options is so important as well, because it's not always just a natural disaster or an EMP that shuts off the power. Sometimes it's legitimately the government, because like I said, ESCOM is a state provider of electricity. And yeah, a lot of our electrical companies here in the United States are private, but does that mean that if the government told them to shut things down, they wouldn't? PG&E shuts down power all the time in California just because they don't want to burn down the forest. But uh, they don't seem to care if maybe somebody needs a medical device in their home that lives in that area. Oh, well, guess you just got to figure it out, right? So all of these things that are happening in South Africa are really good examples as to why you got to be ready for more than just staying inside for weeks at a time, right? And it's a lot of this is kind of revealing to me, which is why I'm sharing this with everybody, because I'm taking a lot of the steps, right? Like I've, I've bought in a property. I've gotten out into rural North Dakota. I mean, yeah, for nuclear exchange, not the best place to be, but uh, yeah, a much better place to be than New York City, right? Well, these considerations still have to be made. And so by moving here and then just shutting down all concepts or ideas that, you know, oh, maybe I don't have to worry about being attacked or having a home invasion or anything like that because now I live all the way out here. Well, that's just going to make me less safe because I'm not being strategic and I'm not considering these possibilities. And instead, I'm just shutting them down as being impossible solely because you know, I live in the country now. So I have to consider these things and I want you to as well. It's happening to people that never thought it could happen. These quick reaction forces are full of people who never thought they would have to pick up a rifle and jump in a truck and drive to their neighbor's home just to find them in a horrible condition and possibly engage in a gunfight with these random people that shouldn't be there. And this is just what's happening there, right? Like that's, that's crazy, but it's not that crazy because it's happening, which means the same possibility could happen here. And those political parallels that we already discussed really concern me because Every day, the media, our government, at least the current one, especially certain departments that we have that are supposed to be balanced, you know, based on the scales of justice, seem to continually divide us further and seem to continually generate more hate within the country. And we don't need that. It's all a lie at the end of the day. It's all pushed upon us by these groups in order to profit for themselves but it's tearing us apart as a country. And what South Africa is dealing with right now is, is the product of what that eventually becomes. So unless there's major change here in the relative future, which I hope there is, but I can't guarantee it. I don't know how much faith I have in our systems at this point in time. Um, I'm expecting things to get worse. And who knows what thought process would provoke people to come attack somebody like me living on a rural property but I have zero doubts that there would be a reason for somebody to try at some point in time, especially if, I don't know, certain groups decided that people like me were the biggest problem, right? I don't know. Do you think that like pro second amendment families living on a property and having some level of self-sustainment might be a problem for certain groups? I, I doubt it. That's, that's crazy talk that they, you know, no one, no one would be like mad about that, but in case they are, you know, 
I, uh, I want to be relatively uh, prepared for it. So I'm trying to take lessons from what's happening down there right now for myself, which is why I'm sharing this information with you and this idea and concept with you, because I think you should probably consider it as well. And uh, look, I mean, at the bare minimum, at least have an idea of what a response time would be in your area in case all you have is the police. Maybe test it out one night. I don't know. Not sure how you would do that, but I'm just saying, find out how long it usually is. If it's 45 minutes, are you prepared to defend you and your family for 45 minutes on, I don't know what you have, a 40 acre property by yourself while under attack by four armed men? Well, that's a question you might need to answer.